part two this week on the loins of history. Thanks for joining us. This is episode four of our series on American political foundations. And this week, we're going to be discussing what the U.S. Constitution says about freedom of speech. So freedom of speech is a super hot button issue right now, and we wanted to cover it uh, to see what the Constitution says. So first, just kind of teeing this up, we're going to specifically look at what the Constitution says about freedom of speech. So freedom of speech is specifically mentioned one place in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, and our founders thought it was important enough to put it in the very first one. So the Bill of Rights kicks off with the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So we're covering freedom of speech. Colin, first question, how would our founders have understood freedom of speech? That's a good question, Jay. And I think it's important for us to understand in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution, to remember that they were appealing to the idea of natural law and the understanding that our rights are given by the creator. So they're unalienable rights and speech is one of those inalienable rights. And if you think about it, and it's not given by the government, it's given by God, the creator to us. And in order for us to give up and limit any of those rights, we have to consent to it because it consent to allowing a government entity to restricting it, because it's important to remember that language and speech and you know, the written word is fundamental to who we are as human beings. We are the only creature on the earth that actually writes things down to communicate. We, our ability to communicate and share ideas really separates us and has led to the evolution of culture, technology, politics, everything that makes us human is really due to our ability to speak and communicate to one another. And if you are going to give up a right and say, I am going to limit this ability, you have to consent to it because you are actually giving up a freedom that truly makes us human. So I think the founders understood that. And that's why they put it in the Bill of Rights to say, this needs to be protected. And with these checks and balances, if there is going to be a restriction on it, and there's a few restrictions it needs to pass these checks and balances. What are your right. thoughts, Jay? Yeah, you're exactly right. So there's a really I read a really good article by a gentleman named Judd Campbell, who is an assistant professor at the University of Richmond School of Law. It's on the University of Richmond's webpage. And if you're on our Patreon page, I can share this link with you uh, for some for some extra stuff. But uh, Mr. Campbell put this really well in 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 an article uh, titled "What Did the Fir- First Amendment Originally Mean?" And he talks about how uh, our founders we we tend to read into the Constitution our current our current questions questions that the founders weren't asking. And he calls his readers to to remind themselves that the founders would have viewed uh, freedom of speech in the context of, like you said, Colin, natural rights. And to define a natural right is, okay, what would a person do if government, what would a, rather, what would a person naturally do if government didn't exist. And free speech is absolutely one of those things. Therefore, if we're going to establish government, we have to ensure that it can only infringe upon these natural rights under very specific circumstances. So if we want to, like you said, Colin, like naturally, we're the only uh, created being that speaks in you know, languages. And I'm sure there's some that would argue with that, but I know we're going to get some biologists that's like, yeah, I know dolphins communicate and they're really smart and they have a big brain, but you get the point. They're, they're not, they're not making constitutions of their own. 
Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, not that we know of, but <laughs> <laughs> you can just imagine these little dolphins with wigs in the in the bottom of the ocean, like here, here, or that's what they're actually what doing. Did, yeah, what do dolphins? What do they? They do like the. <laughs> That's a great. I wish we had a sound. Maybe, maybe. I gotta stop we'll, doing these impressions. Huh? <laughs> someday we'll be able to afford like a sound guy that can insert a dolphin sound. Yeah, one day. Um. Anyway, the yeah. So they would have understood the freedom of speech as a natural right. Well, I think one of the first times that we see a conflict amongst the founders in our early republic was with the Alien Sedition Acts. We talked about it in the mis- in the information war episode. Um, they were created during the French Revolution. The government at the time believed that, and to a degree they were correct, that the republic was in danger of radical ideas coming over from France. And they thought that, well, if we don't control some of this information through by limiting criticism of the government, we could – be destroyed. And, you know, a legitimate fear because they had only been a country for a few years, but this Alien and Sedition Acts basically prevented foreign refugees from coming over and you couldn't criticize the government. And Thomas Jefferson took great, he had, he had a huge problem with this. And he comes out and said, you know, he's famous for quoting that you know, the tree of liberty should often be watered by the blood of patriots and tyrants. And I think that's it's paraphrasing. I think that's pretty close to what he said. But so he was. Wait, he fa- said that during I don't the know Adams it, administration. Yeah, that or is that, you just saying the same guy? Just he's the same guy that said it. So you can kind of understand gotcha. what his thoughts are. The Alien Sedition Acts were during the Adams administration, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Um, he was very critical of that. And the Sedition Acts were unpopular at the time. But you can see that the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists had a conflict initially. And Jefferson was one of the proponents of the Bill of Rights to put them in because he was worried that a government may, acting out of its own interest, try and infringe upon your ability to have a legitimate criticism of the government. Right. You know, it's just as an aside, Thomas Jefferson was a straight up G. He, you know, he was like, hey, we need to have freedom of speech in this country. We can't have... Uh, to use today's terminology, foreign malign influence in our in our you know election interference, et cetera. Uh, but then when he's the president, he will totally send the Marines to North Africa to go invade the Barbary pirates. <laughs> it's like, oh, you want to mess with our trade? Here's the Marines. <laughs> That's where we get from the Marine Love Corps from the shores of Tripoli. <laughs> That's right. It's like we're not. I'm not going to tolerate your information but I will totally send the Marine Corps to come invade your country. <laughs> Love it. An ocean away. Um, right. Which was a big deal at that time for such a, for the early Republic. Um, we digress. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we've talked about, uh, Oh, so another thing I wanted to talk about with how the founders would have understood the freedom of speech is that even though they saw it as a natural right. They did not see it as an unlimited right. And this is, I'm not going to jump too early into the whole social media uh, quandary that we're in right now, but uh, to try to stay politically balanced here, it's important to remember that when somebody tells you from a legal standpoint, hey, you can't say that. Or from a policy standpoint, like, hey, on our social media platform, it is not consistent with our community guidelines that you can't say that. That's not entirely unfounded. As a matter of fact, there's quite a bit of precedent. You know, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater because it causes harm to other people. The principle that I wanted to cover is that Natural rights are checked, are bounded by this concept of the common good. And if you, just because something is a natural right, it doesn't, specifically freedom of speech, it doesn't mean that one can say anything they want if it infringes upon the collective good. 
you brought up social media and I think there's an important thing that I want to say is that the found freedom of speech and these rights are not bounded by the technology of the times that they're written in. Um, the founders at the time, obviously social media didn't exist. However, you know, if you look at it, the printing press was really only what, like 200 years old at the time, maybe they understood that technology changes and it's not limited to say, well, it's going to be, you, if it's quit ink and quill, um, that's the only thing freedom of speech is limited to. They understood mm-hmm. that the technology technology would change and it's not limited to the medium by which you communicate. So that is, that does extend to social media within the common good. So I, I just want to make that point that even though we are, they're writing this in the 18th century, it is not limited to 18th century technology because they even understood that, well, before the printing press, it was, you know, block letters that and most people didn't even know how to write and that the technology of communication had changed albeit slowly right. that change was going to continue to happen over the course of this republic so just want to make that point right. and maybe in another episode we're going to extend that same logic to the second amendment <laughs> oh boy that's actually where i was going <laughs> But again, we digress. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. The if if something is in fact a natural right, the the specific s- technology that's prevalent in civilization at that time is like that doesn't change the fact that we have a right to freedom of speech and. Well, again, uh, it's, it's you're not bound to you are receiving that right from the creator, not from the technology of the time, not from the right. government. So it transcends the technology of the time that you live in or the time that these laws were written to protect. Right. So the First Amendment, if you listen to our last episode talking about property rights, there's actually more explanation on in the Bill of Rights about property rights than there is about freedom of speech. <laughs> Therefore, that that whole idea that the common good checks our right to freedom of speech, it's highly subjective. And there there is not a black and white, hey, this is permissible, this is not permissible. So what we have is precedent. And we have, you know, 200 plus years of court cases that people, you know, judges have interpreted the Constitution and we've used precedent to say, hey, this is what we mean when we say you have freedom of speech. So, Colin, what are some of those court cases that help us understand specifically what we can and can't say? Yeah, so I actually noticed a lot of these came out um typically around wartime because there's obviously going to be a lot of protests, you know, for or against, and there's going to be a lot of government action. Um, so some of them, you know, obviously like obscene materials, like you can't distribute porno- distribute pornography, you know, that's Roth versus United States to burn draft cards or as an anti-war protest, um, to permit students to print articles in a news in a school newspaper over the objections of the school administration, Hazelwood school district versus uh, Kuhlmeyer, things like that are not covered under the common good. And this happened several times um, during world war one, the Vietnam war, where there'd be protests. Um, you know, Eugene Debs was, yeah, he was a socialist workers rights advocate was um, arrested because they felt that his speeches and his protests were, um, a threat to the U.S. at the time, the U.S. government, and would destabilize. And that you could see that again in Vietnam, uh, the protests of the Vietnam War. So things like that are not protected by the common good or under the common good and freedom of speech. You can't go in and you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater, just like you can't slander somebody and be protected under the First Amendment. So back to you, right. Jay. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, it – 
I was actually thinking about Texas v. Johnson. That uh, was one of the few Supreme Court cases that has stuck in my mind from high school. <laughs> that's the that's the flag burning one, isn't it? Yeah, the flag burning one. And it's like, you know, looking at these, um, looking at these Supreme Court cases. So Brandenburg v. Ohio basically says that you can't use your freedom of speech to incite lawless action, right? Like incitement to violence or something like that. Like that's that's pretty obvious when we when we keep in mind that natural rights are checked by the common good. It's like, oh, I can't use my natural right to break the law, right? Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, I shouldn't be able to get out there and say, go get in the faces of this person or this politician I don't like. Go protest and get in their face and make them quote uncomfortable, or go right. protest at these political buildings and trespass, things like that, that have happened over the past two years or so, you know, that's kind of a fine line of, is that protected under the first amendment? Yeah. The, the flag burning thing though, the controversy that this Supreme court case generates is really worth thinking about, uh, for this episode, because in, in one hand, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that an act of burning the flag was protected by freedom of speech. So one one side would say like, hey, what is he communicating here? He's communicating a dissatisfaction with the government, the country writ large. But the other side would say, wait a minute, burning the flag, that could be considered an, in, you know, an incitement to lawless action, right? Like, What's next? Like you burn the flag, you're going to burn the the Texas uh, Capitol building down or something like that next. Um, I remember in 2020, a lot of the, the Black Lives Matter folks like kneeling during the national anthem. That was probably less inflammatory than burning the flag. But the idea is, OK, if we don't want the Sedition Acts, I think generally speaking, both sides of the political spectrum think the Sedition Acts were bad and not a good idea. Where's where's the line between criticizing your government in a newspaper versus burning the flag? It, to answer my own question, I don't think there is a line. <laughs> it's one of those things that's like, I may not like it. I may be personally offended you know, that somebody would burn the flag. But at the same time, we don't write our laws based on whether or not I'm personally offended at such a thing. <laughs> right. And I think it's important because we've talked about it in previous episodes that the people, and I, I this is a, what you, one of the quotes you read, the people are a check against the government. So we need to, as well-informed citizens need to, when we, if we see the other side doing something like burning a flag, taking a knee, you need to say like, okay, if I want to enforce this restriction, do I want something to be restricted similarly that the other side doesn't like against me? Do I want that restriction placed on myself? And Great you hear point. this, yeah, you hear this all the time. Like, I don't agree with what you say, but I'll defend your right to say it to a degree within the confines of the common good, that's very true. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that you can go and say, Hey, you can't talk. Be and that be said, that right there would set a very, very dangerous precedent. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing a lot of that today. You hear cancel culture all the time of, well, I'm in power. So I'm going to turn the screws to the other side. I'm going to pass mm -hmm. legislation or I'm not even going to pass legislation. I'm just going to give orders that say this is now a threat and it's this vaguely defined term. You know, we're talking, we talked about the Alien Sedition Act. Well, you can turn it around to the Patriot Act. Um, you know, the Patriot Act was passed in October, I think, 20, 2001 and existed for about 20 years. And at the, it was passed after 9-11, where everyone was obviously very affected by the attacks on 9-11. So mm -hmm. we passed this law that gave a lot of power to the government, and it was very specific to due process. And we passed that. Took away a lot of privacy. Took too. away a lot of privacy. And there's this loose term of terrorism. Well, 
20 years later, it's kind of like, well, this isn't really a threat anymore. It's still a threat, but it's kind of the definitions kind of slowly changing. And who's a terrorist? Who gets to make that call? And if we just forfeit and, you know, as a politically astute 11 year old at the time of that, this past, you know, you're kind of like, well, yeah, sure. Pass it. I don't, I want to be safe. Um, it's dangerous because you pass this to be safe. And then years later, you are no longer safe because these things, these powers that you gave up um, to feel more safe against somebody else can suddenly be turned against you. Um, and I think the Patriot Act does dissuade against freedom of speech. Well, if they're going to label you um, a terrorist for protesting or something like that, well, then suddenly you can have a lot of your rights stripped away and you voted for it. You were in support of it years before. Yeah. So I, I just think and that's a long tangent to say that anytime there's a restriction on your liberties, you need to be very careful about what you give up because it can be used against you. And if you're going to inflict this on somebody else, remember, it can be turned against you as well. Right. No, that's a really good point. And I'm getting to the point where I really enjoy flipping the switch and like doing, you know, trying to, try to think differently from the other side and talk and ex Exactly what you're talking about. Like, okay, we may not like what one person says, but if I was held to the exact same standards that other person, would I freak out? And the first thing that popped in my head is the phrase, let's go, Brandon. I have seen, you know, folks wearing t-shirts and hats and social media posts, et cetera, talking about let's go, Brandon. And all I can think about is... When Trump was in office, were these how did how did these folks say these same folks act when the left was using disparaging terms, you know, Kathy Griffin, uh, you know, posing with a decapitated head, et cetera? What was the argument? Was it, hey, I don't care what you think about him. That's still the president of the United States and you shouldn't talk that way. And it's like, interesting, you know, like <laughs> it's just like, OK, we. We allow the, the point here, I think the right answer, and I'm not I'm not commenting on whether or not I agree with burning the American flag in protest, kneeling at a national anthem, nor saying a phrase like let's go Brandon or anything like that. I mean, I obviously have an opinion, but the point I'm trying to make is if we want to ban one, what prevents the you know, a few years later when the other party comes in power in banning the other? That's not the, that's not what, that's not the kind of society that I want to live in. I think freedom of speech is important, is important precisely because there is a area where we say, th where we communicate speech that might upset other people. Um, and it well, needs to be permissible. Go ahead. This is, we're, we're spiraling out of a tangent, but I do want to make this point that a lot of that I think occurs and a lot of the freedom of speech issues that we have today, I think is a problem that you see with the dichotomy of a two party system where it becomes a win lose scenario. So mm. it, it's almost like in, it's, it's like in sports, you have two rival teams, like you kind of, you learned, it's almost like you start developing it. People obsess over football teams look at the rivalry between like Michigan and Ohio state, Alabama, Auburn, like they hate the other side and it becomes like, I want to win at all costs. And yeah. you kind of lose sight and it's, now apply that to politics. And it becomes like, well, I don't really care what happens. I just want to win. I just yeah. want to win. And I want the other side to lose. And you know, it becomes a very dangerous game because there's not really, you know, you start to, see the other side as an enemy, an individual enemy. They're the other side. I I don't like them. Alabama fans hate Auburn fans. Right. Clemson, South Carolina, they hate each other for no other reason than like it's the other team and they live on another side of the state. That's <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing objectively wrong about another sports team. <laughs> most of those players probably played high school football together and were friends yeah. and yet fans – Hate, hate each them. other. And that's, I don't want to get into like mm -hmm. a college football talk, but using it as an example, right. it's like, well, most of these people, like you work with them. You generally yeah. speaking, you work with these people, you live 
fairly fairly close and i i like to believe that most people are not what exist online or what you see on the news cycle um most people are fairly normal and rational so you don't need to hate the other side because and or i think a lot of that hatred is started similar to what happens in college sports long way to say I don't think the two-party system is um, conducive to freedom of speech, partly because of this reason. It's it's all a matter of what's important to you, right? The I was listening to you talk, what I was thinking about was like, I was like, you know what? You know who my least favorite Americans are? <laughs> People who drive slow in the far left lane. <laughs> it should be a crime. It should be a crime. Yeah. Well, Straight in, to jail. In, in, you know what? You do this, you go to jail. <laughs> Believe it or not, jail. <laughs> Fantastic the, uh, Parks and Rec reference. Yeah. The uh, Seriously, like if I don't care what your political party is, if who have Republican or Democrat, I don't care. If they stood up in a national debate and said – I am going to prevent the slow drivers from being in the far left lane. Instantaneous vote. Like, you've got it. Because that generates more stress to me on a day to day basis. Give the people what they want. Else. <laughs> I know that has absolutely nothing to do with freedom of speech. <laughs> but it's when you're talking about sports teams, and like, you know, we hate these people. I was like, well, I don't really have a sports team. I was like, who do I not like? People who drive in the far left lane. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> So, uh, using some corporate speak to to circle back, yeah, to bringing it back, speak, bringing it back. So, I think we have a pretty good understanding of what the founders would have considered free speech, why it's important, and that it is a natural, inalienable right, bounded by the common good, ruled on by precedent. You know, within the system of checks and balances. So, applying that today. You hear the term cancel culture all the time from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, cancel mm -hmm. culture, social media, hate speech, all problems of today, um, censorship. And I think today's problems extend beyond ne the government necessarily. What are your thoughts on freedom of speech today and some of the issues that we're facing, Jay? Yeah, so I I'll go ahead and go straight to social media because I kind of already referenced it before, but it's almost like we, I'm so glad you brought this up earlier about technology. And it's almost like we want to think that, oh, technology, it completely changes things. And we have to completely rethink how we're thinking about technology. <laughs> and the answer is no, it's the same principle. Now, the, and I, and I don't want to go too too far in the details because I'm frankly not educated enough about it. But the if a particular platform, a business, wants to come up with certain rules that are – they are subjective. And it, it, I just want to rehash on that point. A lot of these specific cases are subjective, right? The question is rather, does whoever is making that subjective decision have the authority to make that decision? Uh, these social media platforms, Twitter, if they want to say something is against their community guidelines, they have every right to do that. Now, I know the counter argument is it's become the de facto town square. You know, we need to be able to say this, that, and the other. Personally, man, I'm not there yet. I, because in my mind, the only entity that can then tell Twitter what can and can't be in their public guidelines is the government. And I'm not there to where I want the government to be able to tell Twitter what can't, what they can and can't public or, you know, put on their, on their platforms. See, th I think this is one of our, our few disagreements because, because I am there and I okay. understanding that. Okay. Perfect example. So um, what was that other app that was like a, a, a spinoff Twitter Parlor. Parlor. That's it. Yeah. So <laughs> Parlor. So when Donald Trump. A horrible Trump, name for an app, by the way. Parlor. I know. Was it like a, a like a beauty parlor? I don't know. What, what, yeah. But anyway. You don't know if it should have a U in it. 
Anyway, keep going. <laughs> we'll talk about the UK in a minute. Well, you know, you they after Donald Trump was banned, they were like, "We're not going to ban people. Come over to us." And a lot of people started going over there. Well, their servers were turned basically turned off, so they couldn't. And if you, I'm I'm not going to get into the whole like cloud hosting mm-hmm. like yep. IT thing, but basically you had an entity you had. There's like three entities that own most of the, if you want to set up a server through like a cloud hosting server, like AWS, Microsoft, Google, or Oracle, I think is another player. Now you have like four choices. That's basically a monopoly because if they're like, yeah, you're not going to do that without, without violating your first amendment, they basically did by taking away your ability to speak and to host something. Mm -hmm. Now I get it. It's the idea of like, well, we don't want the government to make these decisions for private companies. Yeah. They shouldn't compel Twitter where I stand. They shouldn't compel Twitter to say like, you have to say this, but because Twitter is a four, I think at this point, like a public square, you know, something like parlor, on AWS servers, they should, because AWS basically owns the market. It's like four companies, they own the market. Like you can't be like, well, we're not going to allow this on there because it technically doesn't violate these other precedents. Um, You should be able to allow that on there. It's not the government dictating what can or what has to be done, but it's dictating like you can't take this away from somebody else. And I think that falls under the protect, uh, protection of the first amendment. The government's not creating a law. It's just simply protecting your ability to do something. So well, let me away. ask you, let me yeah. ask you this question just to clarify it for myself, specifically with the parlor thing. I, I, re- I vaguely recall what you're talking about when parlor was like completely taken offline. Was it the decision of the server? Whoever was, Whoever was doing, was it like, you know, let's just say it was Google. Was it the decision of their server to do that? Or did, you know, a, a government entity take Parler offline? How, how did that happen? It was AWS. So so AWS was like, bump that. We don't want Parler on exactly. there. We're going to take you offline. And, and there's a fine line. Like if it's a, if you own a monopoly, I feel like if you own a monopoly, which that's a whole nother Teddy Roosevelt issue. <laughs> with the trust busting that's a whole nother yeah. issue but if you own you know another example it's like if i want to write a book i, I want to write a book about any given topic and amazon says um and a publisher's like okay we'll publish this book and amazon says like we're not gonna we're not gonna put that book we're not gonna sell it on amazon they mm-hmm. own like 80 something percent of the market what publisher is gonna say well 80 something percent of the market will say like 85 percent of the market is gone Oh, well, yeah, we're not going to do that. They have effectively mm-hmm. prevented you from exercising your First Amendment right. Now, you still could do it. It's just one of those areas now where we're getting into that we need to take a hard look at as citizens and say, well, we have these massive corporations that have a lot of power because they have a lot of money. They have a lot of influence with the government and lobbyist groups. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the ways in which we communicate are done through just a couple of them. So I think we need, and I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I think we do need to be careful that, well, should this govern this entity be able to arbitrarily decide who can speak and who can't speak on this? Um, you know, the Ayatollah of Iran has a has a Twitter account. Nobody in this country can. Yeah, <laughs> but the pre- a former president of the United States doesn't. You know, okay, yeah. who made that decision? Did the did the American people? Did we pass legislation saying it? You know, yeah, no. I, again, I completely understand the emotional like uh, the emotional urge to try to create equality on a specific and very popular social media platform. However. Uh, the book publishing thing you bring up is actually a really good example. Talking about Amazon straight up says like, we're not going to sell this on our store. So you just lost 80% of your market. If we are actually f- free market capitalists here, I would think like, okay, is th- like, is there a demand for the book? And I'm not an economist, by the way, for our listeners, but is there a, is there a demand for the book? And if so, then 
I think eventually the market could potentially, I mean, this is a hypothetical situation here, but the market would adjust. Like if Amazon consistently refuses to sell books that have a demand, then that just allows a competitor to come up and say, no, we will publish them. And if the demand exists, then the books will be, you know, people will buy the books and Amazon essentially just loses money at that point. Again, you're assuming that we're in like this, you know, Milton Friedman-esque capitalism, capitalist society. We <laughs> really more, in, I would argue, a corporatist where we've got, you know, it's kind of like, well, why did Teddy Roosevelt have to go break up Standard Oil and, you know, all these trusts? Because, well, just, just go build your own railroad. Just go dig your own oil. Well, it's a lot harder than that. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult, especially when you have a trillion dollar company that's like, um, yeah, you guys aren't going to do this. And we we owned the market so we can dictate the terms of how this market operates. So this idea yeah. of a free market is really severely limited. It's like it's like a, a search engine. Well, there's really only one search engine that people actually nobody uses Bing. I, I hate to break it to the software engineers working on Bing. Nobody uses Bing. And it's not a knock on Bing, but it's just a, f- a statement of fact. Everyone uses Google. And if that's the means by which we conduct a search, well, it's like that's a monopoly that yeah. exists. And they have a lot of power. And now we need to take a look at, well, how is our, our freedom of speech? How are our rights protected by companies that have an extreme amount of power the government now no longer has to make decisions that infringe on your rights a corporation that may fall in lockstep with this government entity might say yeah you're not going to we're just going to become the enforcement wing of the government and we don't have to be elected we have all this power as a matter of fact we are going to have 20 lobbyist groups walking around in Washington, D.C. that are suddenly now going to be more effective than your votes. So when you say like freedom of speech is the government can't infringe upon, it's not just the government anymore. We're we're beyond that, I think. There There are very powerful entities that exist that are not held accountable to you. And the only way you can hold them accountable is looking to the government to say, your job is to protect my freedom of speech. And you're not doing a good job of it because I'm not allowed to say this and it is for the common good, or I'd argue that it is, or 50% of the, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I, yeah, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I, my gut tells me, and we've mentioned this in previous episodes, when we grant the authority for government to do something, right? I think in previous episode I talked about when we allow the when we want the government to take action we have given up just one more small piece of our liberty we've given it up to the government and we are never going to get it back it sometimes it might be for a good reason sometimes it's not i and i'm not saying we should never do it i'm just saying i am super super hesitant to to do that completely agree because i just actually said we need to be very i actually made the point of that a few minutes ago like we need to be very careful but you know you look at the we're talking about twitter you're looking at elon musk potentially taking over twitter or and you know i don't know how that's going to shake out there's like a lawsuit or not if he wins in court yeah yeah, exactly (laughs) you know who knows what kind of like five dimensional space chess he's playing right now or, or whatever but when that announcement was made, you immediately had a freak out from the others because you know, typically it had been conservatives that were upset with Twitter. Now, yeah. as soon as Elon Musk was going to take over, the left came unglued and it suddenly this entity that is not a political entity or supposedly now yeah. might swing the other way. And it's like, oh, I don't I don't like that. I don't like the, it's rules for thee, not for me. I don't like that. Right. Um, that's what I'm talking about here where the government should be like, okay. Um, I think it's Timothy, was it Timothy Wu? He's a, he's a law professor. I think at Columbia, he was like the best way. And we've mentioned it in the, the information episode, um, when Mm -hmm. we talked about Russia, the way to combat misinformation is more information, not a censoring of it. Um, and he uses a lot of legal jargon. I'm not going to get into, but, um, you know, the point is the way that, freedom of speech would be protected is to say like we've we've spelled this out 
we're going to make sure that these private entities are also protecting it. I don't think we've done a very good job of taking a good look at that. Right. No. So this is a great segue into the next thing I wanted to talk about, specifically on why the left was freaking out when Elon Musk was taking over Twitter. Because Musk has himself said he views himself as being or formally being on the left. He's uh, Lex Luthor and, incarnate. Yeah, basically. Uh, he's definitely... Do you see that last picture of him when he's like on a boat in Greece? And he was like reflecting the rays of the sun. Jeff, Jeff, <laughs> it's him and Jeff so Bezos. White. Him and Jeff. Holy, he's got some... Mark Zuckerberg. He, you remember that picture of Mark Zuckerberg with all the suntan lotion on his face? He's like, he he's like not a alien. human. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, he, Elon Musk, you know, he may, he and Jeff Bezos have a little space race. They they definitely have a rivalry, but Bezos has got a beat when it comes to beach bodies. Anyway. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, no, so the next, the this is a great segue into hate speech. Hate speech has been around for a few decades now. And when we talk about freedom of speech... You know, one of the main arguments from the left has been against allowing hate speech and learning. So just for our listeners, hate speech is not a protected or sorry, it is not a legal category. There's no legal definition of the phrase hate speech. So one, just to throw this out there, the phrase hate speech is more of a political emotion generating phrase than it than it is an actual legal thing that gets discussed about in courts and in the law so what that means is so just to come you know full disclosure up front here and that is hate speech doesn't mean anything <laughs> like you Essentially, hate speech, the the very biased and, and J definition of the phrase is if you say something that is against my modern progressive worldview, I'm going to define it as hate speech. And that is extremely unfortunate. <laughs> you know, it's it's exactly that because it's a constantly changing definition. And this is why I think that having written and codified laws and checks and balances prevent something like this from being this forever changing malleable definition based on what I'm feeling at the moment. You know, we talked about it, I think two or three episodes ago, and like why we're doing this is to understand what the foundation of your rights in the constitution, because if to your point about hate speech, it's this, well, if it doesn't fit what I believe right now, it's hate speech. Well, like, what is that going to mean in a year? What is it going to mean in 10 years? Right. You were upset that Twitter is getting taken over by this person that you view as like the devil himself. Well, is that suddenly going to be, hate? you know, it's like, it's constantly changing. What happens when somebody else applies it to you? Right. Suddenly you're the bad guy. That is the danger of trying to limit freedom of speech with some of these things that are not necessarily clearly defined in our court system in the legislative body um you know it's just a, a danger that you need to guard against no matter what side right. you fall under because it right it can and will come back to you yeah i mean let's just take the plain and simple phrase i hate you <laughs> right like the if that's what we mean by hate speech which i know that's not what people mean by hate speech but let's just take the phrase i hate you should that be legally permissible to say? Absolutely. I mean, people say it all the time. We have people on the right and the left who are basically saying so much uh, in political discourse, legally, permissibly, etc. The phrase, I hate you. So that begs the question, what do we actually mean when we say the phrase hate speech? And should that be permissible on social media, in public discourse, etc.? The point I'm trying to make here is uh, we're not – we're just – we're what we define as hate speech, we're basically saying, I don't like what you're saying, and I'm offended at what you're saying. And that is not – sorry, folks. That is not a good way to run a society because that is highly subjective – 
And oh, by the way, you also say things <laughs> that are highly offensive to another category of people. Uh, and we just can't ban. Oh, I, yeah, I, it, it's, I, I hate to ahead. use George Orwell because I feel like he's, it's so overplayed. <laughs> people are like, oh my God. Orwell is never overplayed. <laughs> Orwell was, he, he was, oh, we're, you know, everyone's like, we're living in 1984. It's like, well, kind of, it's a, it's a modified, he saw part of the picture, but you know, I, and I, I can't remember what book or what phrase, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically was saying like, when there's no future, there's no past, there's just the present. Hmm. It's kind of like this, if there's just the here and now, I'm defining things based on how I feel right now. It is not rooted in natural law with the creator. It is not protected and there's not a process, a legislative process signed by the executive, ruled on by the judiciary. There's not these checks and balances. There's not representation. It's not clearly defined what my rights are. It's just this here and now emotion that I don't like this. You are subject yeah. to tyranny, and it, it all comes back to this this tyrannical taking away because that can be a tool to control people, to enforce what I deem as hate speech is what I'm feeling right now, and there's going to be somebody that is going to be dictating what um, I think and feel right now um, or what I can say, right. and they're going to use these people who want – they're going to use these things that it might be tyranny of benevolence – we shouldn't say that. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. It's like, well, your feelings aren't protected. Um, right. And if I can't say this, I can't be critical of a government entity making these decisions. And if I can't be critical of it, I'm not, if I'm not being able to be critical, then I can't be a proper check and balance against government overreach or corporate overreach or something like that. I, I'm not now my right of free speech is being taken away. I can't criticize effectively. I can't hold a check. And suddenly more and more and more of our rights and more power is given to the central body. And it is very difficult, as you said, to get back. Right. So I'm going to paint a false dichotomy just to illustrate a point here. <laughs> so there, there is a dichotomy in art and culture between the classicists and the romantics. So bringing this back to the loins of history, right? The 1700s. You know, the 1600s into the 1700s, the prime time enlightenment time, or there was a, there was a hearkening back to, <laughs> uh, to the classic period, Greco-Roman architecture, which was symmetrical, right? Iambic pentameter poetry, this like specific order in art and culture was highly valued and was indicative of beauty, right? So it all goes into aesthetics here. In the 1800s, we see the rise of romanticism in the romantics, and it was less about order and more about emotion. And we see this in art, we see this in culture, we see, uh, you know, these heroes, or hero stories. Um, you know, you can just read a, a great fun expedition is just l comparing and contrasting the art, the paintings of the 1700s against the 1800s. And what we see is that beginning in the 1800s, Western culture writ large began developing its values based on emotion and not rules, right? This is, this is romanticism in a nutshell, and it's a cultural value. It's not a... I mean, it, it it comes from a philosophical and historical understanding, but it's it's manifested in arts and culture. And what we see today, in kind of bringing us back to the point here, what we see today is that you have on one hand a cultural emphasis on order and rules and logic and facts and these hard and fast black and white dichotomies. But on the other side of the political spectrum, you see a, a cultural value on allowing emotion to define reality subjectively for each person. This is ultimately a, a deeply rooted historical conflict in what we see as good, right? So it's an ethic. And what we see as beautiful, which is an aesthetic, 
when it when it comes to hate speech and freedom of speech and social media so our big thing trying to bring it back here <laughs> is th- those who who make appeals to hate speech their worldview is that they see uh they see things as good they define good by emotion and if you're saying something that brings with it a negative emotion then you've already violated their sub- their the reality conversely those of us that see hate speech as ridiculous it's because hate speech isn't a thing that uh that isn't defined by rules and logic and facts we so therefore to move forward as a society, because I'm not claiming that one view is inherently better than others right now, I do believe. <laughs> but just to, again, this I'm, I'm painting the false dichotomy because I believe there's value in both. But uh, when it comes to specifically hate speech, this is, this is the context of how we got ourselves in the situation. That's a great point. That is, that is a loins of history point. To summarize, I think, where we stand today, at least in the U.S., before we go international, I think the biggest warning, the caution that we have to say is it's a complicated issue right now. There is a blurring of the lines, I think, between private and government authority and infringements upon our rights. And to what we've both said, I think we both, you know, I think the American people need to guard against and make sure that even if it makes us uncomfortable, whether it has a negative emotion to what you just said, or um, it's something that may not fit into our ordered, what we would consider an ordered government, we need to be very careful about what rights we're giving up and what rights we feel are being infringed upon because it's very difficult to get back. And freedom of speech is absolutely important. The ability to be critical of your government and the country writ you know, to the term that we use so much writ large is important for us to really <laughs> progress as a society and as a country. And it's a protection against tyranny, which is what it comes back to. I think That's what the founders were really trying to guard against was tyranny. Tyranny can come in many forms and taking away your freedom of speech is one of the most essential to any tyrant. So that's the U S let's talk a little bit about for international listeners where it can apply for them. What's going on over there. Yeah, no, it's, it's really good to compare and contrast American political situation with the rest of the world. Super enlightening to help us, you know, understand where we're where we're at today. Um, I want to start off with Russia because bringing it back to our Russia Ukraine series not too long ago, it's just the simple point that Russia has a extremely tightly controlled information environment. Right? Uh, they have their own internet system that is connected. It's using very ambiguous terms here that is connected to the global internet system, but the, the Russian government controls it and they have the ability to completely disconnect their internet from the rest of the outside world, uh, which is more like a North Korea than it is a, uh, democratic society. Cough, cough, uh, for any future Russian we don't have listeners. Right now. <laughs> but Exactly. Uh, Yeah. Anyway, just to give one example, because there's tons, this is highly problematic. When Russia invaded Ukraine again uh, this year, there were quite a few protests throughout the country. And I saw an Economist article that was published in March. So the invasion happened in February, late February. As of March, I think it was March 20-something, the Russian Federation had arrested roughly 15,000 protesters for no other reason than just simply publicly protesting against the invasion in Ukraine. So for our for our American listeners, I remember uh, you know, a few years into the invasion of Iraq, and that war got super unpopular, super fast. And there were protests out the wazoo 
And I was thinking to myself, like, what would have happened if the federal government would have instructed police to just arrest people across the board? Like, holy cow, that would have been that would have been one of the most significant moves of government overreach in our nation's history. And yet the Russians just did that and nobody like bats an eye. <laughs> so to your point about Russia's internet and using ambiguous terms being connected to the rest of the world, it's kind of similar to the Chinese. And it's, I think they call it the, uh, the great, the great internet wall of China or something like that. It's basically a firewall that the great firewall of China, the great firewall of China. That's it. So yeah, the, and a firewall is basically it's a block for it, again using ambiguous non IT terms. It's a block. If I was to send information that the Chinese government from like an an IP address um, that they didn't approve of, they would block it. And there's been some publicized information that's been blocked, and it's it's pretty well documented that they do block information from reaching their citizens. And so that's more on the information side, but that prevents access for them and it prevents them from being able to spread in the information necessarily to the outside internally. They don't have access to it. So that it just goes to show that the Chinese have a very controlled um, populace when it comes to freedom of speech, because as we saw at Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government does not take well to criticism and protest of the Chinese government and the Chinese authority. Recently, we saw it in Hong Kong where they very violently put down uh, protests in Hong Kong. If you don't know about Hong Kong, Hong Kong was actually under British authority up until like 1999 or 2000. It was like a 99 year lease. Yeah, so like it's that. it's kind of it's still very much separate, or they like to think of themselves as fairly separate, and mm-hmm. they still have mm-hmm. a tradition of um, more. Western ideals of freedom um, and the Chinese crack down on it. So it's not like freedom of speech is something I think that we in the U S take for granted. And we're definitely, there's definitely, I think some level of censorship and control in, in the it space, but nothing like what happens in China where protests are brutally put down. People disappear at times. You yep. can't spread information online. It is very tightly controlled and regulated. Yeah. The, And the question we have to ask ourselves as Americans, as Westerners, is, is that the kind of society that we want to live in? Because every single time we restrict someone's ability or someone's right to freedom of speech, that's the type of society that we are one step closer to. I feel like that's a Linkin Park song about one step closer to the edge. I'm about to break. (laughs) No, you're right. And Love I mean, like we are, it is, it, that's, that's the thing I think that we try to warn against is it's not for the U S it's not like this. We're just going to vote in uh, the communist party and suddenly like we're a dictatorship. <laughs> it is a very yeah. slow and methodical march. Yep. And that's the thing that you need to guard against. It's, it's kind of like you, you hear the term like frogs boiling and, you know, boiling frogs. Mm-hmm. It's not like you're throwing them in boiling water. You just slowly turn the temperature up. So you have to be very quick. You have to do constant temperature checks of your freedoms and say like, Hey, um, mm. this is not something that, um, I see what's going on in Russia in China and Iran where everyone has a Twitter or excuse me, the Ayatollah has a Twitter account, but, uh, nobody else in the country does. Um, right. Do we want, is that the kind of society we want to move to? Are we on the path to that? Um, Even if we think it's for these benevolent reasons and yeah, we're just, we're trying to be safe. We want to be safe. uh, You can't do that. I mean, recently, you know, we saw with, with COVID-19 and the spread of misinformation, um, you had a lot of unelected officials making decisions on what information could and couldn't be spread, i.e. Twitter. I'm glad you brought up COVID So and misinformation because that was probably the last main issue that we hadn't talked about yet. Well, and I I will make the point that this this is something that has not just U.S., but international connotations as well. So go ahead. I believe that we are going to be arguing about COVID for decades because 
so much questionable stuff happened and we were not allowed to talk about it. So masks, right? It, there were studies, you know, published that basically said masks didn't do anything. And then people were banned from social media. People, you know, were highly criticized because they just said what those studies said. And then fast forward, you had major news outlets who then came out and said, hey, masks don't do anything. My point here is not to rant and rave about masks. My point here is to say, like, there were a lot of terms, you know, a lot of accusations about misinformation, disinformation being thrown out there. There was a significant effort by the U.S. government to control the information. And the question that I would like to ask is, what did that get you? Did, was, was COVID... Was was the fight against COVID assisted by controlling the information about masks? Regardless of what your opinion on masks are, I think the resounding answer to that question is no. No. The we were prevented from having a free and rigorous debate about the masks it, because of an appeal to the common good. And to, to be clear, in the early stages of the pandemic, I tend to give people grace because we just didn't know what we didn't know. And at, at some point in time, I don't know when that was, but at some point in time, we started to know and we doubled down on previous false assumptions. And that combined with a stifling of debate was detrimental to our societal fabric, people's health, you name it, the common good was actually harm. So again, like I'm not trying to point a finger. I'm just trying to use that as a point to say, like when you restrict people's freedom of speech, sometimes it comes back to bite you. And I think that's what we're, we're living in right now. Okay. The, Fantastic points. Be, and, and I'm going to follow it up with a few to tie it into some of the other talking points that we had today. So I, I, this is a total paraphrase of it, but people who chose security over freedom um, shall have neither. Right. And that, that's kind of what we did. We were choosing security, the illusion of security. And you're right. Initially, it's like, okay, let's take a pause. I do give, you know, and there should be some grace extended. But yeah, we definitely doubled down. And like what I said at the very beginning, like communication is fundamental language, speech. It's fundamental to our scientific evolution. Right. You can't have a scientific breakthrough if you can't communicate about something. Yes. It, it is impossible to gain more knowledge when knowledge is being stifled. Mm. You know what would have really tweet that. countered the tweet that. <laughs> tweet that. Tweet that. <laughs> what would really have helped in the – ease people's concerns would just say like, hey, we're going to do the most comprehensive study. We're going to be so transparent about this instead of if you, even even if masks worked, if you stifle somebody who dissents to the point that they can't even talk and they're deplatformed, guess what? A large percentage of your population is going to be like, wait a second, that doesn't pass the sniff test. And suddenly, they're going to become even more worried about it. Yeah. The phrase, the science is settled, is the most anti-science phrase ever. <laughs> like, we were, we were taught the scientific process growing up as kids. And to say, oh, the science is settled, you have to wear a mask, this is done. Like, you know, I can, I will literally have this debate with you with a mask on my face. Like, we can, we can have the, like, like, let's have the debate. Uh, See, and that, and you made a point also about people were being deplatformed. They, it wasn't just the government that, and what I was saying earlier, like, hey, we need some of these private enterprises should not just be able to say, like, you are not allowed to speak. Yeah. Because, and, and there you go. If if something is so universally used, it is basically a public forum, then 
I do think that there is some precedent for the government to say like, hey, you, we need to protect the, your ability to speak on this platform. And I think that's a good instance because people were basically just like, oh, turned off. You can't talk because you, you questioned the settled science, which they didn't. They were just asking simple questions like, hey, maybe we should look into this a little further. Um, and yeah, it, it has been absolutely detrimental to society. And it was only after years of living under it that people finally started to realize something that could have been cleared up in three months or less had we been able to openly discuss it. In a situation like that, more information is better than less information. And another one that I, I really hate hearing is like, you're anti-science. You don't believe, trust yeah. the science, trust the science. You're anti Hey, trust the government. Trust the they science got your best is an anti-science statement. <laughs> hey, tr trust the government. It, it's kind of like, trust the government. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll trust them. Sure. Why yeah. not? They run the DMV really well. So why not trust them with everything else? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it is, it is my, but you know what? It's as people, as American citizens, as citizens of the world, you know, hear this. It's something that you need to understand, like how quickly people are willing to get, how quickly people basically gave up a fundamental right that makes them a human that separates us entirely from the rest of the animal species, the animal kingdom. It's our ability to freely communicate with another and critically think about something. We mm -hmm. basically gave it up. You can't give those up in moments where you feel like, well, it's kind of dangerous because I guarantee you no one, no, and we know this now, more people did not die because they questioned it. That's not, that's, we know that for a fact now, but you would have been absolutely crushed. You, you, you probably could have been fired from a job yeah. if you had said that, you know, in May of 2020. Yeah. Colin, that's a really good point. I think to, to wrap this up is that re regardless of the context, freedom of speech is very important. And that cannot be an, cannot be overstated regard. And it's regardless of your, your, whether you're an American, whether you're a European, Western, or African, like you name it, if you live in Russia, China, anything, freedom of speech is a natural and unalienable right. And, and it's something that we need to be ever vigilant in guarding and protecting, right. whether that's from a private enterprise, it's from the government, it's you just, you have to be very, very leery about any kind of infringement on it. Right. No, really good. Yeah. And that, I think that does it for this episode of the loins of history. Hope y'all enjoyed us uh, ranting and raving about uh, freedom of speech. <laughs> uh, we talked about uh, what the constitution says about freedom of speech in the first amendment. We talked about how the founders uh, would have understood freedom of speech as a natural right. We talked about how our our primary understanding of what freedom of speech actually is, what it protects, what it doesn't protect, is determined by precedent, mainly in Supreme Court cases. We talked about the common good and how that bounds our natural rights. Uh, and then we've talked about some specific case studies of freedom of speech, talked about social media, talked about the Patriot Act, talked about corporate enforcement. Uh, and then lastly, you know, we talked about how uh, this applies to China and Russia and, and other places. And there's tons we didn't cover. We didn't even talk about the, the yellow vests folks in France. You know, we talked about the Dutch farmers uh, last week, but uh, it's too much to cover on a, on a single uh, loins of hip loins of history episode. Uh, but uh, we're super excited. Uh, next week, we're going to continue our series on American political foundations, and we're going to talk about the Second, Second Amendment. Amendment. Da, da, da. <laughs> we're, we decided we wanted to be not controversial and talk about the Second Amendment. Yeah, we're you know, there's just not enough controversy, or there's too much controversy, so we're just going to talk about the Second Amendment. It should be an easy, easy breezy episode. Uh, on that one, I am Colin. I am super excited. I guys, I really want our non-American listeners 
to give us some feedback because the second amendment is one of those uniquely American uh, things. I'm sure there's other gov- or other countries out there that have it, but I just, you know, one of the American stereotypes. The Swiss. Oh, the Swiss have a second or, a, you know, an equivalent to the second amendment. Well, well, they have like 80, they have like one of the highest levels of gun ownership in the world. It's really? like 80 something percent. Great. We'll bring up the Swiss. All they right. do They do some, they do it right. They're very punctual. <laughs> <laughs> and they do they do guns right. Awesome. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the second amendment next. Hey, if you enjoy this uh this episode and what we're doing here, uh please leave us a uh a review. Uh give us a five-star rating that really helps us out in uh getting getting the podcast out there. We're also on social media. You can follow our Instagram account, Loins of History. Uh we're on uh we have a Facebook page. Both uh, Colin and I are on Twitter. Uh, you can look me up at uh, J Loins of History. Colin, yours is Twitter handle Loins of History. Uh, you can also support this podcast on Patreon, or you can go to our uh, anchor page and uh, click the support button. Thank you again for listening to this episode, and we'll see you next week on the Loins of History. Mm-hmm.